evening, everyone. Welcome to our Orlando Evening Women's Bible Study Fellowship. We are so glad to see you here tonight, and welcome to our satellite groups who are joining us. My name is Amy Gabriel, and I am one of the substitute teaching leaders here. And I have an announcement for you tonight, and it involves something next week. Next week is our all-class cookie Chris, Christmas cookie fellowship. And we, yeah. <laughs> Who likes cookies? Anybody? Okay. Who likes Christmas? Yeah. Okay. Well, you're in luck. I would love to see you next week. We're going to start a little bit earlier at 615. We're going to start in the gym, which is that way. Okay. When you get here, there will be lots of people telling you where to go. Park in your normal spot. People will tell you where to go. You can bring your students. You can bring your husbands or brothers or any males that you bring and that are part of the men's class. Everybody's coming at 615 and we're going to have a cookie fellowship from 615 to 645. At 645, the students will go to their class. The men will go to their class and we get to stay in the gym for an extended time of fellowship. So if you ever feel like you don't have enough time to talk to your friends at BSF, next week is your week. I invite you to come 615. You don't need to bring anything other than your lesson in your Bible. Don't need to bring anything special. Come at 615 for our cookie fellowship. I cannot wait to see you there. Have you all noticed Christmas lights? Homes, businesses. Cities are all getting into the light business. Even people are getting into the light business. There are blinking lights. There are steady lights. There's moving lights. There's lights outside. There's lights inside on Christmas trees and so on. Lots of lights around this year, this time of year. There are so many kinds of lights. And did you know as Christians, we're lights too? This week, in John chapter 8, we learn that Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. How are you shining your light of Christ that's inside you? Are you inviting people to join our class in BSF? You know, they can come and try it. They don't have to commit. You have a great opportunity next week. As Amy just said, we have a fellowship. It's going to be an extended fellowship. It's the perfect time to invite someone to come join our class. They'll have a snack. They'll get to visit with some of your uh, BSF group members. And they will get to experience your discussion group in a small, table-like, intimate setting, which is how we're going to be doing our discussion groups next week. So use the light that you have inside you to invite someone to BSF. Next week is a great time. Otherwise, invite them as a fresh start in January. We have our class going on and it is a great time for you to shine your light to anyone that you meet and to have them experience our class. We're going to sing a Christmas hymn tonight. Will you stand with me? We're going to sing Joy to the World together. Thank 
pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we sang that last verse, the wonders of his love, the wonder of your love that would compel you to send your son, your only son, your perfect son, to die a death that he didn't deserve for people that may or may not even accept him. The wonders of your love. God, thank you that you loved us so much that you took that chance on us. God, as we open your word tonight, I pray that you would continue to shine a light on it, that the light of the world, your son, would jump off the pages, that his love for us would penetrate our hearts. And as we dive into your word, I pray that our hearts would be open to be teachable, to be moldable. May you show us something tonight that reveals your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, have you ever been in a dark house and heard an unfamiliar voice? You know where I'm going, right? We instinctively turn on the light because we want to be able to see, right? And we want to be seen sometimes. Um, there's something about the difference between light and darkness, obviously. The contrast between day and night that causes us to feel a different sense of security depending on which one of those we're experiencing. When I was a young married Cheryl, because I was that at one time with no children yet, my husband and I built a house in a new development and we were one of the first houses <clears throat> in the neighborhood to be built, which had a lot of pluses and minuses. I remember one time in particular though, for some reason I don't remember, my husband had to be gone overnight. And so I was in this three-level house all alone, all alone. The minute the sun went down, my anxiety went up. Um, we didn't have window coverings on all the windows, and there weren't many street lights around in the neighborhood yet since it was fairly new. And I admit, I was afraid. I was afraid of the dark. <laughs> the darkness evoked such a vulnerability in me that I did not sleep at all. And I, when I say at all, I mean at all, all that night. In fact, it was only as the sun began to rise that my fear and my apprehension subsided and I was able to feel a sense of peace and actually fall asleep. You see, light is something that can have a dramatic effect on everything, everything it touches. For me that night, the light of the rising sun spoke of security and reassurance. And tonight in our passage in John chapter eight, it offers us a lot of contrasts. Contrast between light and darkness, uh, truth and lies, freedom and slavery, and even life and death. A passage as we're gonna see that begins with the Pharisees wanting Jesus to throw stones at a woman is actually going to end with Pharisees picking up stones in order to throw them at Jesus. So let's open our Bibles tonight to John chapter eight, and let's discover together that Jesus, the light of the world, frees us from sin. And we begin with our first division in verses one through 30. <clears throat> and this account of a woman brought before Jesus may appear in italics in your translation. Um, that's because some ancient manuscripts don't include the story at this point in John's gospel. However, church leaders referred to this passage as far back as 100 AD, and it seems to be a general experience, <clears throat> a genuine experience in Jesus's earthly ministry. And its placement here fits um, in context of light exposing sin. And it also highlights Jesus's character of always showing love to the sinner and grace to the outcast. So let's remember where we are, where we've been. Uh, Jesus has been teaching in the temple courts uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles and opposition to him continued to mount among the religious leaders. At the end of the festival, 
chapter 8 notes that Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. And then beginning in verses 2 through 5, it says, At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Woman, Now, what do you say? Now, let's be clear here. The leadership's motive for presenting this woman to Jesus was not necessarily a positive one. <clears throat> it was the purpose was to incriminate and not just to incriminate this poor humiliated woman but the purpose was to trap and incriminate Jesus they posed a seemingly inescapable test where every potential answer um, that Jesus would respond with could entrap him and they were insincere also about speak, seeking an honorable resolution to the problem because they also heartlessly used this woman as a pawn in their scheme. <clears throat> they showed no compassion as they shamed her in front of this crowd and in front of Jesus. And their self-righteous pride um, fully displayed in this situation here, the hardness of their hearts. In fact, if they were presenting this woman with pure motives of wanting to address her sin, they would have fully followed the law and also brought the man because it takes two to commit adultery. <laughs> but their motives weren't to uphold the integrity of living a godly life. Their motives were basically to stick it to Jesus. They knew Jesus was a friend of sinners, and they knew that his message to them had always been one of grace and love and forgiveness. But the dilemma for Jesus was that the sin of adultery carried the death penalty in Judaism. So to these leaders who were so full of pride and hypocrisy, their, their question posed to Jesus seemed to be the perfect trap that would allow them to have finally this valid reason to bring accusations against him. Accusations that they were sure this time were going to stick. But we see that Jesus <clears throat> outwits them by actually convicting them, right? In verse 7, Jesus says, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. <clears throat> Can't you just see them all standing there and dropping their stones right then and there? Um, as Jesus masterfully, as only he could, reminds them that the statement that they're all sinners and all of them, like this woman, stand guilty before a righteous and perfect God. I also found it Interesting that scripture tells us that those who heard what Jesus said began to go away one at a time. And who went first? The older. Did you find that interesting? Life has a way, aging has a way of teaching us that we are all failures apart from God. So I don't know if that played into it, but um, could be. Only Jesus then and the woman are left as all hers and Jesus's accusers have left. And Jesus tells the woman he does not want to condemn her and he instructs her to go and leave her life of sin. And I just read that and I thought, oh, the grace of God to forgive. Which that forgiveness prompted the woman to respond with faith and obedience. Jesus dealt tenderly with this adulterous woman and it's a beautiful picture, I think, this whole story of kind of a tale of two sinners, two types of sinners. Um, the obvious, the overt sinner represented in the woman, obviously. But then the religious leaders, the religious sinners, the not so obvious, the covert sinner represented by the hypocritical religious leaders. And then I thought, what brought this woman to respond with obedience to Jesus's challenge to leave her sin. Could it be the way that Jesus came to her? It wasn't a, you, the sinner. No, it was, oh, you sinner, come and let me embrace you. Let me heal your wounds. Let me encourage you. Let me show you a better way, a different way. Aren't you eternally grateful that 
In Jesus' world, mercy triumphs over judgment. I was praying as I was reading this lesson that that would be my posture, that that would be my heart towards others as well. So the insertion of verses 1 through 11 serve as kind of a precursor for our need, as we see in this woman, from freedom for freedom of sin. And Jesus' willingness to be that light um, and to be that sacrifice. So when Jesus declares in verse 12 that I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk, walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He's actually using a metaphor here that seeped really in Old Testament allusions as it highlights Jesus' role as Messiah and as Son of God. Because light in the Hebrew scriptures symbolized God's presence. Therefore, Jesus was claiming to be the divine presence that saves his people. As the Israelites, you might remember, made their exodus out of Egypt, it was the light of the shining cloud and the pillar of fire that was the abiding presence of God, leading them forward and leading them in their 40-year journey. So here Jesus was declaring, I am God in your midst. They also would have known that Isaiah chapters 42 and 60 indicated that the coming age of Messiah would be a time when the Lord would be a light for his people, as well as a light for the whole earth. So light is not a new concept for the Jewish people, which is certainly why Jesus used the words he did. He wanted them to make that connection. And the words I am are kind of all over chapter eight. Here in verse 12, I am the light of the, light of the world. Um, verse 24, if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. And then again, we see in verse 28, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. Jesus wanted them to know him. And today, for you and I, we have the living word of God, the written word of God. These are our cloud and our pillar, and they lead us into the light. We also want, um, I also want us to notice and keep in mind as we progress through verses 20 or 12 through 30, kind of what the outcome is from the very beginning, because I think it gives us hope. Even as us opposition intensifies, look at verse 30. It says, even as he spoke, many believed. So regardless of the opposition that we see from these prideful religious leaders, many found what Jesus was saying compelling and their hearts were being changed. So when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, which is the second of his I am statements, he's telling us that he is God with us. He is the one who guides us through the darkness. And remember when we started our study back in John chapter one, verses four and five, John told us in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. What words of hope, right? Jesus shines the light of God's truth and salvation into the world, a dark place. Those who follow Jesus will not walk in darkness, but in his light of life. And well, right away, the religious leaders challenge Jesus' claim, right? The sad thing about the opposition of the Pharisees is that they were essentially the shapers of the culture right, as the religious leaders, and yet they remain opposed to Jesus, even being so ignorant as to challenge his ability to witness to such a claim. <laughs> you can't do that, they say. You need a second witness. <laughs> if you were able to believe, um, if they were able to believe his claim, they would need a second witness. And um, but Jesus countered that his testimony is true because of its source. Jesus, as God, didn't need validation for them, from them or any additional, additional witnesses. And in verse 14, he says that my testimony is true because it comes directly from heaven. And in an attempt to give them what they wanted, Jesus says in verse 18, if you need a second witness, I call the Father. So can you imagine B 
being innocent and being on trial? Wouldn't you love to hear? As our next witness, we call the omnipresent, omniscient God himself. Wouldn't that encourage you in your chances of being acquitted? Who in their right mind would challenge God's testimony? Well, someone living in darkness, as we see in verse 19. Again, these shapers of the culture, um, the Pharisees asked, well, where is your father? The whole theme of the gospel is completely lost on these full-time professional teachers of God's people. And that is that we know the father through his son, as Jesus declared in verse 19. Jesus was able to testify, testify about himself because he is God. In addition, the father testifies for Jesus because the father sent his son. Because Jesus is God, he's sovereign and he's omniscient, making him knowledgeable of all truth. And their refusal to recognize Jesus as the son of God indicated that they didn't really know the father they claimed to serve and worship. And when the conversation resumes in uh, verse 21, the bold words Jesus spoke continued to provoke opposition. And I guess that would be kind of understandable if someone told you you were going somewhere that um, they were going somewhere that you couldn't go. And especially if you were told that um, you were from below and the person that was speaking was from above, right? That might kind of ruffle your feathers a little bit. But that's exactly what our future holds when we don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. As he said himself in verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. In fact, he said that failure to recognize him constituted unbelief, and those that live in unbelief will bear the guilt of their own sin. Well, Jesus can never be accused of a lack of clarity, can he? He was affirming his deity by identifying with God the Father, and Jesus' resurrection and enthronement would be, as scripture tells us, the final proofs of his deity, as he declared in verse 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. Now, here's the truth about sin. The curse of sin goes all the way back to the garden and Adam and Eve. And today, our world and culture refuses to acknowledge that we are born with this sinful nature. It's hard to believe when we look at a brand new baby that sin could be our spiritual DNA, that we're all sinners. That truth is unsettling to the world and they simply don't accept that truth. So it's not surprising that when we talk about the need for salvation, from sin's penalty, it might cut hard and deep for some. The Bible teaches the truth that the wages of sin is death, not just a physical death, but more importantly, spiritual death, which results in eternal separation from God. When we come into this world, we come into it with a death sentence hanging over our heads. We might be physically born, but we're already spiritually dead and we will remain that way unless we come to Jesus for salvation. He, he alone is the only acceptable payment for sin's penalty. But here's the good news. Jesus has come to our rescue and he paid the wages that were due for our sin by dying in our place on the cross that death to sin that only he was qualified to pay is the only acceptable payment that God accepts. When you, when I receive Jesus and his payment on our behalf through faith in him, we're actually liberated from our death sentence and it's lifted. But the flip side of the coin is if, like the Pharisees, we do not put our faith in him, we too will die in our sins. And I know that this is a hard truth, but the truth is there is only one way and that way is through Jesus, our Redeemer. 
The only way to know the Father is through the Son, and the only way to gain access to the Father is through faith in the Son. All of us come to a place that the people were uh, in, uh, when in verse 25 they asked, who are you? Jesus declared who he is, and God's word confirms that declaration. Jesus is the Son of God, sent by the Father to save you and me, sinners, from spiritual death. Jesus is the light of the world, sent to illuminate and expose our sin so that we might repent and turn to him for life. And so a truth for us in this passage is that Jesus' light exposes sin so that we turn to him for salvation. That's our principle. Jesus' light exposes sin so that we turn to him for salvation. Only Jesus can offer true freedom. Freedom from slavery to sin, its penalty and power, and ultimately its presence. And this freedom comes through faith in him. Perhaps the most beautiful part of this interaction is what I mentioned earlier in verse 30. Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. Why was that? Because Jesus brought a message of hope to people who had only heard the emptiness of what the Pharisees were teaching. Hope because God made himself known to us in Jesus and hope that Jesus will lead us even in the greatest darkness. So are there some dark shadows in your life where the light has yet to fully shine? What sins are lurking in the shadows? Jesus has expressed the depth of his love for us by giving his life for ours in order to spare us from eternal separation from him. Do you know a love that deep? It's hard to comprehend. But who in your circle needs to know this kind of love? As a result of salvation from sin's penalty, we are free from the shackles of the world's expectations, and we are free to live as God has always desired. So what in your life or attitude, perhaps maybe even something did, uh, hidden deep in your heart, needs Jesus's forgiving and healing touch? Is there anyone you've judged that, like the woman in our passage, needs your mercy instead of your judgment? The religious leaders and the adulterous woman both experienced Jesus's light in, their, in the midst of their spiritual darkness, and both were given the opportunity to respond to Jesus's light. What is Jesus exposing in your heart? Jesus wants to and will lead us even in the darkness, and I'm so thankful that Jesus's declaration to be the light of the world gives us a glorious hope in a world that just dwells in darkness. And so as we move to our second division in verses 31 through 59, I know there's more for us to discover as Jesus teaches us here about true freedom and who his true disciples are. The emphasis in verses 31 through 47 is on truth because eight times he uses the word truth. Contrary to our current world's view of truth, uh, Jesus himself is truth. He is the source of truth, and he is the perfect standard for what is true. And none of that changes, regardless of the culture or of the circumstances. And so Jesus declared in verse 31 and 32, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So it's, it's really humorous here. Instead of honing in on knowing what is true, the people are preoccupied, right, with the word free, aren't they? They don't like the implication that they aren't free. Um, so almost comically in verse 33, they reply, we've never been slaves of anyone. Did you laugh out loud? Like, I laughed out loud. LOL, I laughed out loud. I thought, that's really funny after what we studied last year. Did they forget that they were enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years? That they had been oppressed by the Moabites, the Canaanites, and all the otherites, right? Through the time of the judges. 
or that they had been conquered by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and now they were under Roman rule. What, did they just forget that? They've never been slaves. It's just amazing how sin blinds us to the truth, isn't it? But Jesus graciously pushes that reasoning aside to address the real issue, and that is the issue that sin has in regards to slavery. They misunderstood what kind of slavery Jesus was talking about. And so he clarified for them in verse 34, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And then he makes this distinction in a family between a slave and a son. A slave might be part of a family, but they have no promise that the relationship would be permanent. But when Jesus frees us from sin, sin slavery, slavery to sin, we become children of God, sons and daughters, and our place in the family is secured permanently. Verse 39, the conversation continues with a debate about ancestry, with Jesus refuting their claim that God was their father, and instead declaring that deeds are um, more impressive than ancestry. Their problem was a heart problem, right? The people were physical descendants of Abraham through whom God promised he would make a great nation of faith. But God's promise also included the provision of a redeemer. Jesus said that their father was the devil, a murderer, liar, and the father of lies because they rejected the redeemer who God provided in Jesus. If Jesus' opponents belonged to God, he basically said, they would hear from God and believe in his son. So Jesus says they do not belong to God. If you're on the fence, though, about how the Jews were feeling about Jesus and what he was proclaiming, you need to look no further than in verse 48, right? They called him a hated Samaritan and demon-possessed. I think that was, like, really offensive back then. Um, can you just picture them standing there with their fists clenched and calling him the meanest thing they could think of? A Samaritan and a demon-possessed person. Their angry words, though, revealed the hardened state of their hearts. But I love how Jesus responds with mercy and again extends an invitation of salvation in verse 51. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Once again, the people miss the heart of Jesus's words, but that does not negate the reality that when we are physically born, we are actually spiritually dead. And the beauty of salvation is that our death sentence is lifted. And while we still experience physical death, we will not experience the spiritual darkness of eternal separation from God. If anyone keeps my word, he will not see death. Unfortunately, though, the unbelieving Jews continued in their stubborn opposition, even accusing him of elevating himself above Abraham. Jesus knew that God the Father would glorify him, and he challenged the people to a faith like Abraham, who did not fully understand salvation, and that salvation would come, but he put his faith in God and his promises, and he rejoiced in what he believed was to come. Religious privilege is not genetic. To be a true child of Abraham is to have faith like his in the unseen promises of God. What Jesus says about himself in verse 58 is important. He says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus here used the eternal name of God, announcing that he is God. This is Jesus's most remarkable claim in all of John's gospel. And Jesus's use of the absolute I am points to God's self-identification as the great I am that we read about in Exodus 3 in verses 14 and 15. I am who I am. And he says, this is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. There's no mistake about it. Jesus claimed to be God. And the religious leaders understood this. And they understood the strong claim to deity since we read that they picked up stones to kill him. 
And so the truth that we draw from this passage is that Jesus's light liberates us from the penalty of sin and spiritual death. That's our principle. Jesus's light liberates us from the penalty of sin and spiritual death. Have you been liberated? Do you know God through the person of his son, Jesus? Like I said, the Pharisees were full-time professional teachers of God's word. They talked about God all the time. But Jesus said, you don't know God. Jesus came to offer salvation so that we would not be separated from God. Our faith does not have to be the spiritual death sentence that hangs over our humanity. Jesus, the light of the world, experienced the darkness of spiritual death so that we might be liberated and enjoy the light of eternal life. The darkness of this world can leave us overwhelmed and it can leave us uncertain. And it appears increasingly unsafe, yet it's comforting to know that the darkness will not prevail. And just like that sleepless night in a three-story house many years ago, light comes and it does expel the darkness. But as we close, I want to remind you, maybe warn you or challenge you, if the light is moving and the people stand still, eventually people will find themselves in darkness again. And that doesn't mean that you will lose your salvation, but you do lose the guiding light of Jesus lighting the way for you to go. When the light moves, we are to follow. Then we will stay in the light. And he will lead us all the way into the presence of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you that you were bold, that you wanted to make yourself known, that you wanted your people to know that you were the Son of God sent to be their Redeemer. I thank you for your word, your written word that is our light and our guide today. I pray that as we go to our discussion groups, that you, your Holy Spirit, would continue to teach us that through the conversations we have with one another, as we share what your Holy Spirit has illuminated this week to us personally, that uh, we would be able to learn from one another and that we would grow in our love for you. God, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.